Okay. Well, let's guess. So, um, welcome everyone to our uh, one of the last series of the uh, London Festival Architecture Talk. And today we uh, have the lost and found sauna of the London 1948 Olympics. Um, so, yeah, let's um, let's start with um, organizer uh, by our British Sauna Society, and I will introduce Mika Maskinen, who's our chair of the uh, Sauna Society. Just have a very quick, brief introductions of what we do uh, as our missions. Thank you. Yeah, um, my name is Mika. Welcome my behalf as well to this third and final event of, um, of the series of talks organized by the British Sauna Society for the London Festival of Architecture. Um, I'm just going to give a quick intro of British Sauna Society and then hand back over to Wendy and uh, get on with the actual uh, program of the evening. So um, it's the British Sauna Society. Uh, we operate in the United Kingdom. We have about 100 members and, and um, emerging online following as well. So our mission is to uh, promote sauna culture in the UK and we hope to um, reach all the experts and enthusiasts of sauna uh, in the UK and uh, we are very um, proud to also be um, the national member of the International Sauna Association which connects us nicely with the uh, sauna family internationally. So yeah you can find us on our website on uh, britishsounds.org.uk and uh, as the name society um, implies we are a group of people and we are a very enthusiastic and diverse group of people who first and foremost are interested in the life affirming qualities of sauna and how they can um, how they should be accessible to everyone in the country and uh, sometimes we have meetings we used to have physical meetings in the in the before pandemic and lots of sauna events now we are only coming back to um out of the lockdowns but we've had lots of zoom events like this and we're we'll very happy to organize uh reach new audiences through zoom and uh facebook live but we didn't really think of reaching out to before the pandemic and uh and quickly about our activities we are can i advance the slide in any form there we go yes so we've organized uh, exhibitions kind of serious things We've organized lots of sauna events and educational events. Those are kind of things that you expect from a sauna society. We also had really wacky events, creative events, like this kind of like a dry, steaming uh, laughter yoga session at one of our meetups. So there's a lot of kind of breadth and um, uh, depth to our activities. And uh, currently uh, we have a crowdfunding campaign going on in uh, Hackney to kickstart a uh, community sauna into former Olympic site. We'll talk about more, more about that later, but if you, if you keep the address spacesite.com slash Hackneywick sauna bus in mind, um, uh, you, can, you can go there and find out more later. All right, without further ado, I let Wendy introduce the speakers and we can kick off. Fantastic, thank you, Mika. Um, so as you can see, so Mika uh, Maskinen is our co-founder and the chair of British Sana Society. Um, then thank you for your introductions. And then for our, um, he will be speaking about the lost and found Olympic sauna that uh, it's relocated from Olympic, um, from the Richmond Park uh, to Kent after the uh, 1948 games. And after that, we will have amazing curators um, from the new standard exhibitions at the Finnish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale this year. So we have Laura, Philip and Christo um, that they will be talking about different expert of the um, post war constructions, um, the sauna culture in Finland, and some amazing um, document uh, 
about this particular style and standards of the uh, sauna in Finland. And uh, after that, we will have um, Andy Merritt, uh, he's architect. Uh, he is from the Something and Sun um, uh, Limited. Um, so they built a barking bathhouse, a pop-up sauna at the Olympic 2012. So, uh, and after that, we'll have a, a brief, brief discussions and talk about the site. Um, Mika just mentioned in the um, Tuckneywick area um, that is within the current Olympic Park. So let's see if we can connect all the things together. Let's see how uh, we can learn from the 1948 Olympic sauna and the post-war constructions and how can we learn that um, to for our post-pandemic recovery. So let's start with Mika. Welcome Mika and let's see how have a look at the sauna in 1948. All right, so I'd be very keen to share a recent discovery of a very special sauna that happens to be situated here in the United Kingdom, but has a very uh, unique connection to um, uh, Finland. Olympic movement and uh, I guess the history of uh, construction materials, construction engineering. And um, I'm hoping this, this serves as a worthy intro to the, to them, or maybe um, started to, to conversations that, that follow. And, um, and um, it's really an extraordinary story about um, how a sauna can go missing for 70 years and then pop up again as almost like a time capsule of, of containing artifacts of old times and comes with the history and such. But um, to, to really understand why Olympic saunas are, um, are um, a thing is that um, the Finland is a relatively young country of like 100 and, 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 and uh, couple of more years ago. So, so uh, really um, used um, sport and sauna as, as a tool for nation building and, and build international profile. And uh, in early to mid 1900s, Finland just happened to be very good at sports and, uh, and uh, sauna was to a certain extent attributed to that success or built put together with that, with that story. And um, the Olympic games, um, what kind of perfect stage did you boast? So the eyes of the world are on the event, and if you succeed, you get lots of attention for your what, what what you do and what your country does. And and nowhere else was that as pronounced as um, in 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 Paris. We go back a fair amount of time, but but um, but uh, Paris Games in 1924 were very, very special because a a a thing called Pavo Normi. Uh, won five gold medals at Paris Olympics in the midst of the heat wave. So not unlike what uh, um, Northwestern Western parts of Canada and, and the Pacific Coast are experiencing other places in the world at the moment. And he was very vocal about sauna use as a key to his success. So he swore by sauna and sports massage that were a competitive edge for him. So was other competitors for blacking out, out of heat strokes, he just kept going and winning. And, uh, and that was, that success was kind of repeated a couple of times in, uh, in Olympic history. So in Berlin 36, uh, uh, Germans actually wanted to build a sauna on site and created a version of Finnish sauna on the Olympic village there. And that was documented uh, by Leni Riefenstahl in, in, um, in her film Olympia Festival of Nations, which is obviously not without political baggage, but uh, but it's, it's featured featured there. So there's this idea of athletes relaxing in the sauna, jumping in the in the pond, and uh, and uh, taking care of themselves in in midst of the competition. And um, then after the war, we land in Helsinki. Sauna comes home, 
and uh, that's when the Finnish Simon Society's own bathhouse got started. So in a sense, Olympic Games kind of accelerate these projects um, in the cities where, where they get um, hosted. And uh, one of the kind of last mentions of hyper Olympic Samus was from uh, Tokyo 1964. This is the uh, only document we have on, on, on those games, but it looks like they are two men wearing white shirts and ties and sitting in a sauna, which apparently heated up to 120 degrees, but again provided massage and shower facilities uh, for, for athletes. And uh, yes, but we're here to talk about the 1948 event and uh, those were known as the austerity games. So right after the war, money was scarce, resources were scarce. So uh, not a lot of new venues were built for the games, but um, uh, what they did build was they, they repurposed uh, a barracks in Richmond Park. So if you're familiar with London, Richmond Park is, um, I don't know, 10, 12 miles from uh, uh, center of central London. Uh, and um, and uh, the Olympic Village was housed in the park. And, um, and this became known as the first sauna bath in England, by the press at least. So this is a clipping from a, a newspaper in Tasmania. Uh, and it very accurately describes that sauna is about pouring water on, on uh, hot stones to generate steam. And, uh, and, um, and they also to give the first clue about the, the provenance of the sauna, which, was about, which, which came from this movement of prefabricated housing. Um, and before we actually go to the, the sauna itself, um, so the sauna was part of, um, uh, well, provided and designed and manufactured by Kultalo. So we have experts here to talk about uh, that, that uh, company, Transmedia's Timber House is uh, limited in, in, in detail. But yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, built in, uh, manufacturing film and uh, transported over to England, built on site by local builders. And after that it was still moved twice and put together twice after the uh, Olympic installation. And uh, this kind of rough blueprint of the, or, or plan of the sauna building. And you can actually see that the actual hot room that people usually call sauna is actually just a small one part of the building. So a lot of real estate or footprint was um, used for washing, uh, uh, massage, changing. Massage featured very heavily in, in, in those times as a kind of purpose of a sports oriented sun. And after the games, um, the sun was moved about 40 miles over to Kent uh, to, um, as part of kind of Finnish English collaboration, cooperation in, in paper industry and uh, and handed over officially by the embassy olympic committee and so on and then used by reed paper mills uh, for their workers uh, recreation so reed were really into sports and sports collaboration so they, they they sponsored their own athletes they sent two athletes to the helsinki olympics in 52 and played football matches against their uh, respective companies in, in Finland. So they have strong connection to Finland because they imported paper, um, uh, wood pulp from Finland to be turned into newspaper, um, newspaper sheets and basically. And uh, sadly the company is now defunct, but the sauna is still defunct there. All right, uh, I've talked enough. So let's actually have a look at what the sauna looked like in the fifties. And this is a clip from uh, uh, British Parthé Newsreel. Over to Aylesford in Kent, where the only Finnish sauna bath in this country is giving work people at a local paper mill something to get steamed up about. First, a soaking for those poor old aching feet. Both these men, long distance runners, are regular visitors. Then into the steam bath, kept at a temperature of 200 degrees and smelling sweetly of burning silver birch logs. Leaves from the same tree, specially cut in July and stored, are used for massage. The dried leaves have to be soaked while the bathers are heating up. 
The room is so hot that even the steam in it can't be seen. It never condenses. It looks a painful business, but actually it hurts no more than a brisk rub with a towel. And a beneficial oil from the leaves seeps into the skin. A gift from the Finnish Olympic team in 1948, they sent it prefabricated when they returned to their country. The sonobath is said to produce amazing tonic results. A cool off, a good soaping and back into the steam bath to go through the whole process again. It's the bath to take when you're all worn out, if you can find the time and the energy. Good, good. Yeah, that, that clip just makes me smile every time I see it. It's just such a such a real deal that's going on there. Like, uh, um, but yeah, let's jump forward to 2020 when we actually got to visit the site and um, and uh, we we found through um, pretty much a pinball email through pinballing email conversation through the Finnish Olympic Committee to the Finnish Embassy. And a few other hands in between that uh, there's a sauna in Kent. It's been there for 70 years and has been used by a local sports club. And uh, now they were reaching out to, to get help to uh, preserve and, um, and um, rejuvenate the, uh, the sauna that had received very little attention, at least international attention up to the, up to the point. And, um, we met there, so so Wendy and myself went on the on site with um, uh, and, and and our uh, colleague Mina, and we met uh, Richard, uh, uh, Rodney, and Daryl, who who run the club there, and they kindly gave us a tour of the place, as in, uh, and that was in uh, October last year around Halloween time, and we made a little video of that one as well. So uh, instead of me trying to explain what it looks like. Let's have a look. Hello there and welcome to this video tour of a 72 year old sauna tucked away in Aylesford, Kent. And it's not just any sauna but one brought over from Finland specifically for the 1948 Olympic Games in London and then relocated to the sports grounds of Reed Paper Mills where it's remained in operation by Copdown Sports and Social Club until present day. Let's go through. Turning left into a spacious changing room, your attention is immediately drawn to two original massage tables which signal that muscle recovery and athletic performance went hand in hand with relaxation here. The space just oozes history, like the scale that only speaks in imperial units. And look at this original period decoration and wall-to-wall -wall wooden panelling. There are enough hooks and hangers for 40 people to hang their belongings. It's Halloween time, which means issues with electrics. Someone must stay at the fuse box and keep a finger on the right switch for the duration of this tour. The pictures laid down here are usually hung up on the back wall. They capture historic moments with visiting dignitaries, athletes associated with Reed Paper Mills and correspondents with the Finnish Olympic Committee. Going back through the hallway, there's a toilet on the left, pretty standard. The next door leads into the kitchen and the fuse box where a conversation is taking place. The fire hose on the right is out of date. Stepping into the washing room, we see a not so standard foot bath and two showers, one warm and one cold, which originally had three heads to cool you down from bro to toe. Back in the day, this was also where a sauna attendant wearing a white coat and a velvet collar would look after patrons, pour oils into foot baths, prepare birch whisks by soaking them in warm water and offer cups of tea for bathers' refreshment. Finally, we've arrived at the inner sanctum of any sauna bath, the hot room itself. Heated up to 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, the hot room easily sits at least 10 people. 
four levels of wooden benches to sit on ensure that bathers can choose on their taste and how they feel in that moment. Most importantly, to create the essential sauna sensation, any of the bathers can draw steam by pouring water on the heated stones. Finns call this steam Lölu. This concludes our tour of the Finnish Olympic sauna in Aylesford, Kent, one of the very few landmarks remaining from the 1948 Olympic Games and a singular piece of sauna bathing and sporting history. Thank you for watching, have a good steam and see you on the bench. There we go. Uh, thank you for watching. Um, yeah, um, I think the video kind of captures the, the experience of uh, walking around it um, the best as I could, could imagine at this moment. But um, yeah, you, you can see that like it's got a lot of um, very um, uh, original features. So everything is quite, quite um, pretty much where it, where it used to be. So I think that the heater has changed from wood burning to electric. But, um, but lot still remains in its kind of original kind of um, original condition and with obviously layers of, of age and patina on, on, on top of that. Cool, I think uh, I've used up my time now. So, uh, right, so what's gonna, what's happening now is that um, we wrote a story about this for the Finnish Science Magazine. And this prompted us to apply for um, and actually, yeah, the local newspaper in Kent also uh, picked up the story after our visit, which was really good for, for awareness and, uh, and, and ongoing efforts to do something about this site. And, uh, and Wendy and myself are now working towards um, writing a, a book or booklet or, or publication of, of, of some sort about that would capture the story of the sauna and, and document it. Um, with the aim to uh, at least preserve it in in uh, in, in memory or in, um, in recorded memory and uh, and see uh, in what kind of condition it is um, could it be uh, preserved restored and uh, and uh, how do we keep the story of this sauna going and uh, yes so this is possibly the oldest surviving Olympic sauna in, in existence. And, uh, and uh, with these um, notes, I thank you and uh, pass on the baton to back to Wendy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's just very fascinating, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's a question comes up. Is it possible the oldest uh, surviving Olympic sauna in the world, maybe some the historian from the New Standard Exhibition's uh, curators can help us to find out a bit of this, give a more histories of the um, the the building itself and the company who built behind that. So yeah, let me introduce you our next uh, speakers. Uh, we mentioned earlier, they are the curators from the New Standard Exhibitions, currently on show at the Venice Biennale for the Finnish Pavilion. I think it's until November the 20, 21st. Um, hopefully we will be able to travel to see it in real life. And um, so let me introduce you the three speakers. Um, so we have Laura, uh, she is the Laura Berger. She is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Auto University. Um, and um, she has been the, um, uh, study at the uh, University of Cambridge and the UCL, and she has been focused on our auto and the organizations of the post-war reconstructions in Finland, the development of suburban areas. Um, and she's been, and uh, our staff, 
Fulbright, visiting scholar at the Columbia University, New York, and a visiting scholar at Roma Trial in Rome, and Sobony, Paris, and many others. And then we have Philip Tilwell. Uh, he's for, he was born in the USA. Uh, he's an architect, educator, um, particularly focused on the uh, timber constructions. Um, and he's, uh, he's also academic and professor uh, at the architectural reviews now, right? Maybe you can tell me more. <laughs> um, uh, um, and next we have Crystal from uh, also um, from Helsinki. He's at the moment the architect and editor in chief of the Finnish Architecture Review. Uh, his professional experience into the restoration of project teaching and research. Um, he's also previous, previously a lecturer at the Aalto University and uh, you uh, specialize in post Second World War architecture in particular. So yeah, let's hear uh, more about, you talk about the uh, company behind the Olympic sauna, which is Puttalo Oi, maybe you can correct me if it pronounces it right. Uh, yeah, let me pass on the uh, stage on you guys, please. Okay, we'll begin by, uh, we have some, Visuals here will begin by showing. Um, thanks very much for inviting us. Uh, I think you you introduced us correctly, which is to say that uh, we're, we're the curatorial team behind the exhibition, which we're calling New Standards, which is um, currently on view in Venice and is basically an overview of the activities of this company, Putolo, um, which in Finnish simply means wood house, but was translated into English as Timber Houses LTD. Um, the company was responsible for the construction of a vast amount of housing in Finland and throughout the world from 1940 to 1955. And so the exhibition documents this through archival materials and contemporary photographs of some of the things that exist. Obviously, the reason we're here today is because one of those buildings that they built and manufactured and exported was the, uh, the sauna that, you're, that you've discovered. Um, the sauna actually, the birth of the company relates in fact to another Olympics, um, the Olympics that, that didn't happen, the 1940 Olympics that were to have been held in Helsinki. So um, as some of you or anyone from Finland will know that there was a, there was a big campaign of building to construct for the 19, what would have been the summer 1940 Olympic games in Helsinki. Uh, but that campaign, that those Olympics never happened. They're actually one of the, the last, I believe the only time the Olympics have ever been canceled outright. So the games were then given in 48 to London because of the outbreak of war. So the architects who had been working on those buildings, um, among them, uh, the gentleman on the left is uh, Urio Lindegren, the gentleman on the right, Toyo Yanti. Um, as a side note, Urio Lindegren, Christo just informed me, was the winner of the London of the 1948 uh, Cultural Olympics for Architecture. So uh, he won, there was back, there was such a thing as a cultural Olympics uh, coincident with the, the athletic Olympics and Linda Grand, the man on the left was the winner for a building that he built a sports facility in Finland. But actually our research relates to the man on the right, Toivo Yanti, who designed the Olympic stadium with Linda Grand. But uh, after the cancellation of the games went to work for the Putalo company designing these modest wooden houses. This is a image from the spring of 1940 uh, when there was an exhibition adjacent to the Olympic Stadium that was actually showing these houses that were going to revolutionize Finnish, construct, Finnish construction uh, by expediating the, the means by which housing could be built, wooden housing could be built. The reason for this was quite simply that uh, the loss of a huge portion of the country um, to the Soviet Union through the war had resulted in the need to resettle uh, more than 400,000 uh, Finns who were then coming back to, to uh, Finland. Uh, and this simply would not have been possible with the current means of construction of wood, of wood housing uh, throughout the country. So um, in spring of 1940, the Putalo company was set up um, and essentially what it did was it consolidated the resources of timber production within Finland. So 21 of the largest uh, wood 
timber products companies were consolidated so that they, they would share, they would still own their factories, but they would consolidate their design uh, resources into a central office in Helsinki. Um, this, the idea was simply to expedite, uh, to sort of move construction out of, from the building site and into the factory so that there could be a higher level of prefabrication and less site work required, less labor, faster construction times. Um, you talked about the movement of the, the building in uh, from one site to another in London. And in fact, the, the movement of the components from Finland to, to London in the first place. Um, and that was enabled by the systems that Putalo uh, produced for their construction. So they were based on these prefabricated panels uh, that were uh, manufactured in the factory uh, to include things like doors and windows and claddings and insulation, uh, all arriving to the site uh, with a high degree of finish. And then they would be put together on the site by a small team of men uh, and, and sealed to make a building. So this was the, the sort of bread and butter of the company were these uh, panelized houses, which they then turned into uh, products that could be shipped around the world. So here we see one of the Putalo company's uh, leaflet covers and, and also the timber houses LCD. So this is a translation that was really yeah, originally used by the company itself. And um, uh, here in the leaflet, um, a couple of pages from there, these illustrate quite well the kinds of buildings that the company manufactured. So the previous one was from Australia, and here we have one uh, from UK. And here is also a school. Uh, a lot of uh, schools especially were exported to UK and, and for example, Scotland. And those came in very uh, different sizes. And here again, you have Salo Sauna. This is one of the very early models, a very compact sauna, as you can see. And this is also one building type, which became popular early on. Yes. Um, one quite curious kind of structure are these round buildings. Um, here you can see a little bit in the other image below how they were uh, put up. But so, um, there were all these, uh, also these uh, plywood tents, and they could be used for different purposes. And one of them was was having uh, the plywood tent as a sauna. And here we have an image where you can see the other tent uh, is being used as as the dressing room, and then you can open the doors so that uh, the uh, the uh, and next to it is the actual sauna, and you can move between the two spaces. And um, uh, while these round uh, structures, they were quite interesting on, its, on their own because they were used also for multiple different purposes. So in particular, the uh, armies uh, <clears throat> were purchasing those, and it, they were also used as accommodation, but also, for instance, as stables for horses. So I think this is also interesting that um, this round building, which, which was super convenient as a sauna, so you could modify it always for different purposes. But then later on, after, after the uh, war, um, there's obviously a new kind of uh, uh, kind of a new wave of sauna culture because during the war time, it was actually often that um, people were. Uh, constructing the, a small building that they first used as the actual house and that same house was oftentimes then transformed into a sauna when when it became possible to build an actual and a bigger house uh, on the same plot. So here you have an image of that. It's one of the uh, uh, original adver advertisements from the company from the time when people were starting to uh, by small villas and saunas from the company. And these also illustrate the same point. So uh, uh, what's interesting is that even though, um, especially in the 1940s, so uh, the sauna culture was really closely tied with uh, cleanliness and, and also uh, health. And obviously uh, it was also important for the uh, 
armies to have these. Um, it, it was part of the relaxation. And uh, one aspect, for instance, was that uh, this, is, this is kind of a legend, partly, uh, but the Germans were really interested in, in the saunas and curious of, of also of how, how the Finnish army was so effective. And one theory was that it's because of the saunas. So one uh, destination for exports that, that still remained uh, quite big after the war was in fact Germany and the other one was Sweden. But here these images make it quite clear that the sauna was also becoming this uh, product and something that individual people wanted to uh, purchase and uh, uh, have uh, as part of their country house. So usually you would have a country house or a small cottage and then a separate sauna building there. It's still nowadays quite common. Yeah, well, during our two-year research project, we also found out that Putalo had actually manufactured this sauna for the London Olympics in 1948. And we were also able to locate these original drawings in the Putalo archives, which are located in, in Mikkeli, about 250 kilometers from, from Helsinki. We have spent weeks in, in searching the thousands of drawings there. And uh, <clears throat> here you can actually see this uh, modular structure of the of the building. It's, it's a one meter module that was typical in the post-war period. And also uh, there are two initials in the drawing. First is TJ, meaning Toivo Jantti, who was the co-designer of the Helsinki Olympic Stadium. So he was the kind of main designer of, of this building also. And the other is KH, is Carl Humalisto, who was the illustrator of the company. And he was responsive, responsive for, for thousands of drawings and uh, advertisements and, and so on. <clears throat> and here's the uh, original floor plan of the, of the Olympic sauna. <clears throat> but um, when we found out this, uh, this, these drawings, I also remember that once my father had told that there is a copy of this London Olympic sauna in Helsinki. Uh, it's located in, uh, in a tiny island in eastern Helsinki, built in 1950. And at the time, uh, uh, it was a, a staff retreat for the Connect Corporation. Kone is today one of the largest manufacturers of elevators and escalators. Uh, carriers. Yeah, 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 so on. Um, at that time, uh, my grandfather was the HR manager of the, of the Connect Corporation. And he was responsible for, for organizing this uh, retreat for the, for the workers of the, of the company. And for that reason, my father and his brother and sisters, they had to spend all their hol holidays in this tiny island with the other families. So I heard a lot of stories of, of this, this place. And uh, we also once visited it with my family. Uh, so the, the building still exists. Today it's uh, owned by the city of Helsinki and used by the Finnish Scouts organization. Uh, but when you look at closely, uh, the design is very similar to the Olympic sauna, but it's not exactly the same. So this building is three meters shorter than the Olympic sauna. Um, and in the archives, we also found going for kind of um, and photographs for a third sauna. It was built by the Finnish Sauna Society uh, in much central location in Helsinki. But that building, uh, it has been demolished in the, in the 1970s. But you can see that this design is actually exactly the same as the, um, the summer retreat. So we found the drawings for this building also. So, well, you can see that this kind of modular system allowed to kind of modify this same, same design concept quite easily. And you can also see this signature of, of Toivaganti in this, these drawings. Maybe one interesting detail in this uh, floor plan is the uh, small room in the, uh, Upper side of the of the drawing, uh, it's in Finnish sauna. So, uh, living room for this uh, lady who took 
uh, care of the sauna and uh, wash your back if you want it and, and so on. It's an interesting cultural detail. Uh, but yeah, that's what we have found on about this this building or these three three buildings. Yeah. So lastly, we don't miss a chance to kind of uh, publicize our research. The the book for this the document Putalo in detail is something that we've thankfully just sent off to the printers and is coming out in August. Um, it doesn't give us. I think there is still yet another book to be written on the the saunas of Putalo. I confess that we we gave a great deal of. <laughs> they were a sort of side note, so we're really happy that uh, that we were able to learn about the existence, the continued existence of the one in the UK. And we'll be very happy to answer any questions as as best we can. Wow, that's fascinating. I think it answers so many questions we had earlier. Um, how that was moved from Richmond Park to Kent. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I saw there's some delays. Does anyone hear me okay? Yeah, we yeah, hear you good. fine. <laughs> it was it was a funny delay. Myself can hear me twice. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it's fascinating. Or also seeing all these um, versions of it, uh, the Olympic sauna that in where Christos uh, Christos uh, families and in Finnish sauna society, and really hope we can visit see that those one day and um and laura also mentioned this new wave of the sauna cultures you know after the post-war um and there's so many questions that we can maybe you know uh compile it together um so yeah just a quick note does anyone else have a questions do pop it on the chat box so we can answer it later all together and i know the time is a pressure so let's welcome our next speaker andy Moritz. Uh, he's an architect, and so we said about, so he was the um, designers uh, behind, an architect behind the Barking Bath House in London Olympic 2012, and it was a pop-up, it was amazing, I remember, so popular, lots of people get beautiful sort of response to it, so let's hear a bit more about that from Andy, and then off to you. Hi everyone. Can everyone see that? Because I know sometimes it doesn't work. Um, yeah, so um, we did the Barking Bathhouse for the 2012 Olympics. Um, it was kind of linked to the cultural Olympiad that was kind of part of, of the London Olympics. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, we worked with we worked with a arts arts production company called Create as well on the on the um, commission and with the uh, London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, which is, uh, I think it's in zone six. So it's on like the outer stretches of London. Um, <coughs> it's in Essex, essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, we kind of um, we got the we got the commission to to create something for the Olympics. It, it, it didn't matter. They didn't say what they wanted. We just had to come up with something. Um, and uh, I think we came up with the idea finally in about January two thousand and twelve. So we had about seven months to get everything designed and built and ready in time for the Olympics, which was sort of like a deadline that wasn't going to move. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we just wanted to create something. It's, it's something that we like to do with all our work. We just wanted to create something that is people can use, um, that people can relate to. And it's part of just sort of a, a long tradition of, um, you know, like one of the pillars of humanity. It's kind of like one of the things is well being, and people love saunas and that people know how to interact with them. Um, but the thing is, in the UK and much of the world, is that it's become this kind of individualistic thing that's um, expensive um, and, yeah, it's kind of about yourself rather than a communal experience that is cheap. And um, so one of the things we did with the money was to make sure that we could run the project um, for the duration 
and only charge local people two pounds to get into it, which was essentially just to make sure that anyone that got a ticket was going to turn up, hopefully. Um, and then people outside of the borough of Barking and Dagenham, um, it was only eight pounds. And that was like a key part of it because no, no matter what, how we designed it, if it was going to be expensive to get into, then it, we were only going to have certain people that were going to come down to it. Um, and I think because it was because um, because it was quite cheap, it, it created quite a lot of funny scenarios playing out and people mixing that wouldn't normally mix. Um, so you just get uh, yeah, you just get all types of people, you know, like London and Barking and Dagenham is one of the mix, most mixed um, uh, areas in the whole of London and London itself is pretty mixed. So you just got lots of different people all coming down and it was, um, yeah, it worked really well in that way. Um, uh, but yeah, so we, um, I guess the, the sort of co the core kind of ideas behind it were that we wanted to um, reflect the wooden architecture that is often used in saunas, um, but is also used in a lot of um, Essex architecture, like a lot of a lot of buildings in Essex are made out of wood, and um, a lot of the kind of um, fishing buildings as well are made out of wood traditionally. And Barking was traditionally a fishing port; it was like the main fishing port for London. Um, and then we also uh, wanted to make it quite a, a reasonably heavy building, just because I think there's a, a thing in the UK anyway that it's kind of saunas are associated more with um, women going to them and we just wanted to make sure that it was it was mixed in that way as well um, and yeah I guess the way that we work is we'll design a building but we'll also a building or a sculpture or an installation whatever but we'll also um, create the experience inside that building in a way that in a similar way to a um, in a way like kind of like a Hollywood film production company like we'll create the whole team to make the project happen and we'll employ the people um, to then run that project as well um, and uh, yeah it's kind of like we create little little worlds essentially uh, uh, the, our bigger projects are kind of are like that anyway the project we did before this was a was a farm in a shop and it was it had similar principles um, um and yeah let me go through some more images um so this was like one of the initial sketches that we did which we just wanted to um so one of the one of the um things that we wanted to do because we knew it was going to be temporary was the what was going to happen to the structure after so we wanted to make it out of lots of little buildings coming together so those little buildings could be pulled away and taken away like the like the the sauna in the 1948 Olympics, which we didn't actually ever know about, like um, only being contacted about this um, talk was the first time I've ever heard about that sauna, which is a bit of a re regret because it would have been amazing to link up the idea with what happened then. And uh, because we were talking, you know, like when we were um, designing the space, we were looking a lot at Finnish um, saunas. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a shame that we never had that had that as a reference point and like we could have you know who knows where it would have led um knowing that as well um but yeah anyway it was it was essentially each each of the rooms was a building and then it uh they they went around a central one uh, very long corridor um and um uh and then so we did that drawing and then we just sort of drew out some of the sort of concept drawings about what the different experiences were going to be like. We wanted it to be quite, um, uh, get people back to basics essentially, um, and also get people outside and just like the use of heat to, because because people are going to be hot. We thought people could, that would, that would encourage people to be outside anyway, to cool down. So, so some of the room, so the uh, relaxation room, for instance, didn't have a roof on it um because and we just wanted people to cool, to cool down underneath the underneath the trees and get the shelter and if they were rained on then they were rained on um and the same thing with the um uh we had a kind of shingle beach as well which i'll show in a minute um this was uh the initial cad that we did which sort of shows quite clearly about all the different spaces so the uh the front i don't hopefully you can see my cursor maybe not um, on the front bottom right, 
um, is the uh, other toilets, and then it was, and then it went into shower rooms. Um, um, we had an ice room, a sauna, a relaxation room, a kind of nail beautician room, um, and uh, and also some kind of uh, like. Um, um, massage rooms and then the big space without the roof was a uh, was kind of like a uh, you know how how in in um uh how do you call it essentially like these kind of big banks of materials that are used within industry and it was supposed to be kind of like that with these kind of big banks of um shingle on them and then the on the the sort of large large room large building with the uh, clear roof was a bar and for events and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, yeah, this kind of clearly sort of shows it as well. So this is kind of like a slice through of each of the spaces um, starting. So the top top left is at the front of the building going through the building. Um, uh, and then, yeah, that's the, that's from the outside. Um, it was, um, yeah, it was pretty manic trying to get it built in time. So it was, <laughs> um, and we would, um, yeah, we just kind of, we followed the same aesthetic. We wanted to um, create one because because even though it had all these different spaces coming together, we wanted to use the black and the material to kind of unify it as one one building. Um, and, but the, the site, it was quite amazing because we put the sign up as the last thing, which was quite a big sign. And as soon as people, people were kind of reacting to the project you know like seeing this architecture coming up but not really knowing how to how to engage with it and then as soon as we put the sign up and it said what it was um and there used to be a bathhouse in barking as well which is another part of the reason why we did a bathhouse um but people immediately started to started to come up to the building before it was open and wanting to find out when it was going to open and it's kind of like that pat the power of the bathhouse right it's kind of <laughs> um was there to see uh, uh this was the ice room um so it was kind of like a used a commercial uh freezing unit um and it was kind of like a supposed to be kind of like one of those commercial freezing units that you get in um in supermarkets or whatever um uh and it had crates for people to sit on um we had quite a few problems with the freezer unit at the start because it kept um turning off at night for some reason and then all the ice would melt and then refrost on the floor um <laughs> but uh, we eventually got on top of that um and then and then on the left is a picture of the um uh the bar and on the right is the relaxation space um i haven't got all the images because we only uh, greed everything yesterday so I, I was digging up as many as I could but there was some some missing um, and uh, and then this is um, yeah that's the sauna the sauna which was a wood burning sauna um, and uh, which it created amazing smells going right through the town and um, and uh, on the right is Paul who I work with and Ralph uh, who, who we brought on uh, as part of the project as well. And we created, I guess that's kind of like down to the detail that we created for the project. We created these, um, actually I should put it on because I've still got one, but um, uh, we put on these um, gowns that had Barking Bathhouse on and people could buy them, but you've always got one if you went in. And we had uh, like vouch Barking Barking Bathhouse vouchers. And the other side of the project was we gave local people um, grants to start their own businesses inside Barking Bathhouse as well. Um, so that, you know, like any beauticians or um, massage um, masseurs, they, they were given um, a grant to start their, uh, they already had their business, but it was to help support that business. And then they work from the Barking Bathhouse and that still can, those people that were part of that um, still work together and still go under the name, uh, the Bathhouse. Um, and then this is the uh, the larger outdoor space that people can go and relax in. Um, and then just because Wendy was asking about if there was any other projects since then, it's kind of that we did this um, uh, smaller version in Ireland, um, 
which was um, just because it was right next to the water, we wanted to, um, we, we created this little sauna where people would get really hot and then go down into the sea to cool down. And I guess it was, it was the, the architecture, we scanned a, a very old oratory, which is a kind of very old form of church. Um, just because through the Barking Bathhouse, we realized this kind of um, uh, religious kind of feeling that you get within bathhouses and saunas. And, it, you know, like, um, uh, you know, I remember uh, someone was mentioning in a sanctum of the, <laughs> and that, but, you know, like you do, we did sort of, and everyone walking around in their white robes and there is like a religious feel to it. Um, and uh, so we sort of started playing with that a little bit um but yeah people would just go down and um go into the sauna and uh jump into the sea i'll leave it as that yeah fantastic like you say if that was connected but we were only find out this um uh olympic sauna literally just just last year wasn't it so it was just lost for 30 years and i was imagining how these people maybe just try to keep it to themselves. <laughs> um, and it's fascinating to find out how the uh, story behind the uh, Barking Bath House and how the um, design and the, uh, all the amazing thinking and drawings behind. Um, what happened to that afterward then, the Andy? You said it is uh, relocated and did they dismantle it or was it be reused to something else? Uh, I think the main word to describe what happened was politics. Um, so uh, it became, it was chosen as one of the gifts of the games. So but there was, I think there were seven gifts of the games and uh, um, including the, the velodrome and all these other things. So it had that kind of, which meant that it was supposed to stay, um, but there was just a big, um, uh, big arguments about uh, people not wanting to, so the Olympics, I think they just ran out of money essentially and they would, they just didn't want to uh, distribute it. So it went and now there's on, on the site of it is a leisure center. So I think it's, it turned it, but the, the, the bit that stayed together were the, the team that we put together to do it and they still, they still run, um, run the bathhouse, but it was a shame because it, you know, especially in the, with, you know, talking about it, what happened in 1948 and they did relocate it it's kind of mm -hmm. like that kind of um, that story would have been amazing if they had, you know, if, if everyone had stuck to the promises. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Yes, that's uh, that's lots of to learn from that, isn't it? Both uh, both Olympic standards and on the different eras. Uh, so um, any questions up here now? I think next, let me just uh, quickly as we said, now we're, we have, um, so after the London Olympic uh, 2012, the, the Olympic Park is still there. So it's a loss of rich generations uh, afterward. So um, we, as a British Science Society, we've been, as Mika mentioned earlier, we actually um, been trying to do this uh, uh, site on the, at the edge of Olympic um, in the Copper House area copper box <laughs> um so yeah hopefully this will link yeah link something together so let's introduce paul who is the um urban designer uh landscape architect and uh, and the founding directors of uh, tapers tree which is a um urban landscape design company uh, he's also a design council expert and then executive director of the Hutneywick Fish Island Community Development Trust. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, so, um, so the site that we're currently looking at is um, on the canal side. Um, so it's sort of on, right on the edge of the Olympic Park um, where it abuts the Hutneywick area, um, but on the Olympic Park side of the canal. Um, it's on a piece of land which is part of a scheme currently called Hackney Bridge. Um, it previously was known as Clonaco Key. I don't know why it changed its name, but it did. Um, and that's a kind of temporary building that's been put, a collection of buildings that's been erected for, they say temporary, I think it's for about 10 or 12 years that they're actually due to be there. 
um, as a kind of meanwhile use um, for a site which ultimately will become housing under the long term master plan for the Olympic Park. Um, I think it's one of the last phases of housing that's due to be built. Um, and they've got, it's a kind of split level site. So the majority of the Hackney Bridge scheme is at a higher level. Um, and then there's a lower level area, which is actually at the same um, level as the canal towpath and fronts directly onto the canal towpath. Um, and part of that's being used as a community garden, which is under construction right now. Um, and then there's kind of a section at the end, which isn't part of the community garden. And that's a space that's been identified as a potential location for the um, for the Hackney Wick sauna bath, which would be fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we saw they have this um, um, kind of something happening on the side. Mm. Um, while we're trying to get get just a couple of slides out, maybe we just ask any questions here to our speakers so with um, Philip, um, Laura, Crystal, and Andy. So. Oh yeah, that's the area area of view of what we just um, talk about, but. Um, yeah. yeah, so you can see there, so there's obviously um, the, after the Olympics, a number of venues such as the basketball arena and the water polo site were dismantled and taken away. Um, and then a the number of other buildings were retained so in the foreground of that image um, you can see the Olympic Stadium obviously on the left and the Aquatic Centre on the right um, and then in the area circled um, sort of just to the top right of that the large grey building is um, what was the media centre is now a, a mixed development called Here East um, and then the copper box you can just see two sides of um, and then the energy center is that, um, it's actually a core 10 structure, but the building with the large chimney is one of two energy centers that were constructed and power the whole of the, or provide um, hot water and um, power for the whole of the Olympic Park. Um, the other one's the other side over by Westfield. Um, and then the railway line kind of cuts through between the energy center and the copper box and the site that we're looking at is right next to the railway line. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's it's a meanwhile use. It's quite a lot of similarity this way, maybe with where um, the parking um, side have the shingles here. This is a concept that was um, based on the pop up kind of ideas. So yeah, the reason I want to bring it up is um, we like to be able to see how these things all connected. Um, then that this meanwhile use can be um, relocated in any ways, could be the future of relocating, even we, if we can uh, refurbish the, um, the Olympic Simon 1948 and like Risto, Crystal have this uh, copy, um, uh, mentioned this uh, uh, functional, they have a few signers in different part of our, uh, Finland area. We are very fascinated about all the um, uh, the new standards uh, subjects we have. Um, so yeah, would be would it be a side we can bring in all this um, modular prefabricated um, signers and to be as a pop up experimental place to um, on the in the Olympic Park. I think will would we'll be quite a fun exercise if we can um, learning from the new standard um, prototype, maybe with one of the options. Uh, I'm very fascinated about when Philip shows how that was relate, relocated. It's the, it's the different side of the paneling systems um, can transport it from Finland around the world. Um, as, as um, yeah, could that be one of the experimental building method we could, we could, um, ex we could try on the Hackney Bridge side? Uh, 
And could it be, um, yeah, anyone have thought about that? Well, I could say one comment. There is actually one other project in, in Helsinki, a school built in 1955 by Putalo, mm. kind of similar model of system. Uh, and it has been demolished, but but they have taken uh, or stored some of the, the original panels and, and other structural parts. And now the idea is to build a um, kind of pavilion out of these these panels on the same same site. So there will be a new school because well there's need for for larger building, but as kind of part of this uh, history of the site or to preserve the history, there is going to be a, a pavilion. So it's at least in Finland a kind of pioneer example of kind of uh, circular economy on the in, in building. I think it's fascinating that, um, you know, we've seen today the, the kind of building that was 70 years old and which um, survived from the 48 Olympics and is still there, still in use. Um, and yet, unfortunately, heard the story of how the 2012 sauna kind of barely made it to 2013, um, <laughs> which is, I think, a real shame. And, um, you know, I think it would be quite, um, quite fitting if we were able to to create a new facility within the bounds of the Olympic Park from 2012. And I think um, seeing the chat there, there's a comment from Johnny about, you know, support and post COVID and mental health. And I think actually <clears throat> one of the things that's most interesting in some ways about the sauna is that, you know, it kind of sits on this boundary between mental health and mental well-being and physical well-being as well. And actually, um, you know, I think from that point of view, it is very pertinent at the moment when, We've seen a lot more people, um, you know, with mental health issues and, you know, from COVID and being at home alone and and also just making more of their local green spaces. And certainly I know, you know, the communities in Hackney Wick where, I mean, our office is just across the canal, literally directly opposite the site. Um, and actually, you know, there's a large residential population in Hackney Wick and actually those people have really made the most of and benefited from the park and all the sort of green open spaces that are around so I think a, a facility like this would be another fantastic addition um, to that as well. I think this interesting um, contrast between the two saunas is that the 1948 sauna physically survived to today but um, it kind of disappeared from public consciousness whereas the opposite seemed to be true uh, with Barking Bathhouse, it, it, it might have uh, physically dis 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 dissolved or, or have been, been uh, repurposed to something else, but so many people still talk about it. It's definitely imprinted in people's memory and a and, and, and lot of uh, lives were impacted in, in a positive way and, and changed for, for better because of, um, because of it happened. So, so I think there's a whole generation of sauna enthusiasts who... who came to be because of the project mm. so, so sometimes the um, i guess the, the impact is uh um can, needs, needs to be measured in different different ways i guess it's interesting to see that like does the existence of the 1948 sound it still um is in is, is uh stands does it does it prove that um or validate the, the methods and engineering developed by Putala Oy and Tim Behousis, or kind of like, is that method, is the method they developed still relevant today? Um, I guess that would be a question. I think that's, I mean, that's something that we've asked ourselves and been asked a lot over the course of this project. Like, what is the relevance of the systems that were, I mean, we were, we we're presenting, the, the exhibition we present is in a very, is in a biennale where like most everything is like built in the last five years. So to present a kind of historical perspective is, is raises this question. And there are some things that I think are relevant about it. Um, one of them that has come through is the kind of, there, there are early examples of what we nowadays would call a sort of mono material construction. So the buildings built by Tupputalo largely because of the kind of availability of materials at the time are pretty much all based on wood-based uh, or they're all built of wood-based materials. So you have 
timber, you have cellulose fiber boards for insulation, sometimes just air cavity, uh, dust, sawdust and planar chips for the insulating of the floors. And this meant that their behavior kind of in, in a technical sense, they, they didn't kind of have a lot of mold issues. They didn't have, they breathed rather naturally. And so that has been kind of one of the lessons, I think, in the longevity is that a kind of um, a monomaterial wall section um, performs well over an 80, the buildings don't have significant kind of mold or deterioration problems, even though plenty of buildings from built within the last 20 years have dramatic problems from those effects. The other one that I think has come through for us as a kind of through line is that because they're done in wood, they're so easily manipulable. They've been able to really be adapted um, by users can modify them to kind of and make, I'm sure the, I would say the, the London, the 48 sauna, the Olympic sauna is a rare example for us of the many pool tall houses that we've seen of a pretty unmodified uh, structure built by the company because more often than not the private houses and the schools have been modified dramatically. You know, walls have been taken down, they've been made smaller, bigger, um, but those changes have also been what enabled them to continue to exist. Uh, the, the sort of flexibility of the system and the, the nature of the wood construction allowed people to, to change them to suit whatever needs came about in an 80 year or 70 year time span. Yeah, that's amazing that, because um, I think at the moment they are in the, the weather and the, in the dilapidated uh, state, I think we were called because um, the uh, children of that generations, they want to help uh, to preserve this in, in terms, you know, so we, there's lots of um, work to be done. That's why we are here, try to maybe record it, maybe need more help from um, you guys in terms of that documented the authentic side. Uh, hopefully, maybe we, we are hoping, hoping we can make it either listed in terms of the structure that being protected. So like what Philip, you said, this has been not modified as amazing qualities they have uh, for that building. Um, and also in terms of saying, I, I, you know, there's a one point about when, when they say they, they are trans, trans, they can transform into, you know, an outdoor sound building and always a part of a home and to be a sound building um, over the town. So, yeah, so do you um, say, how could we, can have that, kind of modified or is, is any treatment that we could could kind of preserve that building itself um i mean it's 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 how to say it's a modified over time at the moment in terms of the usage that lots and lots of uh, some of the original integrity of uh, you look at the movies from the uh, the 1950s and now when we visited so maybe where the um the storage of the the timber areas uh are lost uh because it's become an electric electric uh stove so um so i wonder you know some of the examples that you know in terms of maybe well, yeah I was going to say one thing that we found, I don't know if this is definitive and you guys can, my colleagues will disagree if they feel otherwise, but probably the best way for any building to be maintained is for it to remain in use. Um, in the UK, the mm -hmm. examples, there were a number of, it's, a, it's another chapter to this whole story, but there were a number of schools exported to the UK, um, as we mentioned briefly. Yeah. Um, most of those, the schools that remained in use, uh, where that remained as schools have been maintained and the ones that didn't have been very often kind of uh, taken into, taken down. Um, so I would say that in the example of the sauna, the best use would be that it continue life as a sauna. I wouldn't propose in any way a kind of repurposing of the, of the building for another, mm -hmm. for another use. But of course, there are perhaps some opportunities like in some, for instance, firewood storage that isn't necessarily needed 
could be used for um, additional kind of updates to the building. Uh, so there are probably some opportunities there. But the, the thing that could be said is I'm quite sure, and based on your video, the core structure of the building seems to be very good. It's, it, it seems to be that the building is in very good shape. So there's every opportunity for it to kind of um, to be continue to be used for its for its original purpose. Yeah, and of course, because it's not a uh, residential building, the kind of uh, insulation is not. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's one challenge that with some of these buildings, they maybe don't have modern insulation standards. Uh, so such that that causes difficulties if we're talking about housing. But in this case, luckily, saunas are, are their own source of <laughs> rather good heat. So um, so that's not such a concern. That's really encouraging news. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think we, sh we could have, have a, we definitely will we use that, um, what you're saying, that the building should be maintained in use uh, to preserve these um, amazing uh, structures in the area be, being demolished or, you know, not being used in the future. I think that was a, the best, you know, one of the best code that we could definitely use. Um, so yeah, uh, is other panelists have um, any kind of questions, conversations you want to? Yeah, kind of wrapping up statements possibly <laughs> <laughs> as well at this time of the day. Well, one thing I was just yeah thinking of maybe adding that I think also applies in general. I think it's quite interesting to also think about what makes architecture or certain kinds of buildings valuable. So like, like here in our presentation, it became clear that the same architects were designing these monumental buildings that really represent the country, such as the um, Olympic Stadium. So these more modest structures are usually forgotten, even though there are so many of them. So they provided housing for the masses, but also just, for example, the sheer amount of saunas that the company produced. So that's quite amazing. So I think this is also something to think about that also behind this Olympic sauna, there's, there's a really well-known architect who has signed the drawings, but still, I would guess that probably because the structure itself is sort of, it, it, it appears so modest, so it's not kind of easily associated with a well-known architect. And I think this is also an aspect to think about when when not uh, thinking about uh, making good arguments for the need to preserve structures like this. Um, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, just because I, I guess we did the project nearly 10 years ago, um, which is a bit shocking, um, but yeah, it's cut, I just kind of it's reminded doing the talk. It's just uh, reminded me about the about the qualities of saunas and just how they just yeah just like on a well being well being level in the sense that it it helps your body but also your mind and um, yeah it's kind of reignited my interest actually <laughs> about trying to trying to do future ones and especially about how they can how I guess. Yeah, I'm interested about how they can become more sustainable as well, just because they do produce so much heat. And what happens to that heat um, is quite a good question. Because um, I don't I don't know if you if anyone knows of any that have actually kind of tried to use use the heat in another way that's coming coming out of a sauna, but um, there might be something quite interesting from that that I'd like, yeah, be good to explore in future projects. And I was actually down in Kent earlier this week. Um, and we were talking about the the paper mill, um, read paper mills um, on an, on a, on about about the metal that they use for the paper mills. So it was something completely different. But but yeah, it'd be interesting to to go and visit that that one and go and have a yeah, have a look. But yeah, I just I just think there's a lot of potential there still to to uncover. Um, so it got me excited essentially. <laughs> Yeah, let's all head over to the, the site in Kent when uh, when times 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 allow. So um, yeah, it's just off uh, M M twenty to Dover. So um, it, it is it is a not a 
not easy to discover, but um, but but surely uh, we could we could work with the with the sports club over there to um, to to investigate and help help them help them out after that. So, but it is still there, and uh, obviously it'd be fantastic to visit the the sister saunas in 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 Helsinki and uh, by the sea as well. That, that was new information to me, and it was really really nice to hear about that connection as well. Okay, I think we're coming to eight o'clock now. Um, I think we our time is up. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, I can't believe time flies so so quickly. There's uh, um, amazing speakers and there's amazing um, presentation and story behind. We learned so much with this. Um, I really want to, you know, continue this if we. Um, people want to keep in contact we put up on our event bright and also there's a i think the new standards have the book coming up uh which have the on your last slide we're we looking forward to uh, know more about it when you launch and uh um and looking forward to how to visit uh, the sister sounders of the Olympic sound in Helsinki next time when we are there um with uh andy we hope maybe uh we can go and um, visit that you know, keep keep the contact open because that building literally are uh, um, in the call out for refurbishment, uh, and I think that's uh, some potentials we need to help them to to make it back to the right standard. Like Philip say, a good sound need to be used, and a good building need to be best maintained uh, to be used. And uh, yeah, Paul, also thank you for your input on the Olympic side. You are the expert on that. We will hope to continue working with you and uh, on the uh, Hutney Wick Sound Bath project. And as we said earlier, this is a crowdfunded project um, that you could still find online. Um, anyone want to um, help us to make this happen, um, then we will send the link uh, in through the Eventbrite as well. You can look at the Space Hive. Um, yeah, so thank you so much.